Hello, welcome back from the break. Um, we have three more wonderful speakers for this next session. Um, and uh, we will again have a question and answer session at the end with all three speakers in this part of the, of the day. And uh, so please, again, put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, first off, we're going to start with Melissa Wilson, who's going to tell us about sex chromosomes in health and disease. Melissa Wilson is a computational evolutionary biologist whose main research interests are sex bias genome evolution. Her lab studies the evolution of sex chromosomes, which are the X and Y in mammals, and how changes in population history affect the sex chromosomes and develops novel approaches to incorporating sex as a biological variable into genomic research. Her lab typically studies mammals with a particular focus on how the evolution of the placenta has shaped sex differences in human health and how sex differences in the placenta may underlie sex differences in the developmental origins of disease. Dr. Wilson completed a bachelor's in mathematics at Creighton University and a PhD in integrative biosciences at Penn State University. She was a Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, before starting the Sex Chromosomes Lab at Arizona State University. While the lab primarily focuses on mammals, its location in the Sonoran Desert precipitated additional projects, including the study of sex chromosomes in the Gila monster. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wilson. Great, thank you, Tina. Um, so I'm Melissa Wilson. I'm a professor of genetics, evolution, and bioinformatics. And I, I am so thrilled about this symposium. I think, Dr. Green and Dr. Dietz for putting this together and the whole, the whole, whole group who organized uh, the support from the top down is just so exciting to see. And I couldn't have asked for two better people to start off this whole symposium. And so I'm going to comment a little bit, um, actually starting off with thinking about how sex differences are multidimensional, the way that Dr. Serrano was. So I was trained as a mathematician and the way that I've approached thinking about sex differences is absolutely in this multimodal most multimodal, multidimensional space. So generally, um, the first thing I like to do when we highlight that we're studying sex differences is to narrow in on the variable that we're talking about. And I, I think that's critically important for, for anyone in any project. And just historically, we've done a more poor job of doing that when we're studying sex differences. So as a geneticist, I'm generally interested in studying sex chromosomes and sex chromosome gene content and genetic components of sex determination. So we can think about this one dimension. A second dimension could be gonadal hormones that are being produced over lifespan, uh, gonad development. Uh, these are just three of the dimensions that we, we tend to think about in, in research spaces and clinical spaces and what makes these all really interesting and exciting is that they vary over time. So there we go. <laughs> uh, and this, this isn't layering on the social, political, gendered expectations that come um, across the populations, uh, which, which was brought out. Uh, one of the things I want to do is take a very large step back. And so when we think about, when we talk in humans, about sex chromosomes, they get relega relegated to this position of being important for sex determination. Uh, but in fact, sex chromosomes are not necessary for gonad differentiation. And I wanna walk backwards in time a little bit. And, and we'll start with mammals. Humans are a mammal. Most mammals, nearly all mammals have what's called an XXXY sex determination system. And when we talk about XXXY, all that means is that the individuals that develop eggs and have ovaries can produce a gamete, an egg, with one kind of sex chromosome, the large X chromosome here. And the individuals who have testis and make sperm can make two different kinds of gametes, one with an X chromosome or a large sex chromosome, and one with a smaller degraded sex chromosome, and here a Y chromosome. 
but this is not true across life. And one of the really cool uh, counter examples is birds. So uh, in all birds, they have what's called a ZZZW sex determination system. So in that case, it is the individuals that have testis and make sperm that can only make one kind. And that's a kind with a large Z chromosome. And it's the individuals who have ovaries and make eggs that can make one of two different kinds of eggs, one with a large Z chromosome or one with a small degraded W chromosome. And it gets more fun and exciting when we look at other species. So in reptiles and squamate reptiles, they, there are some examples in this group that can have XXXY. So the testis havers can make a sperm with one of the two sex chromosomes or ZZZW. So the ovary havers are making an egg with a Z or a W. They also have parthenogenesis, obligate parthenogenesis. And that means that they're individuals that um, only produce eggs. So there are uh, there's no sperm havers at all in those populations, and there's facultative parthenogenesis, which means sometimes there's individuals who have eggs and individuals who have uh, sperm, uh, but occasionally the egg havers will just reproduce clonally. Uh, there's also environmental sex determination. So depending on the temperature at which the egg is incubated during a really critical developmental time period, that will determine the gonad development of the offspring. Why this is really cool is because it means that in individuals with environmental sex determination, so alligators, crocodilians, uh, turtles, and tortoises in general, a few have sex chromosomes, but most don't, most are environmental. There are no genetic differences. There are no encoded inherited genetic differences between males and females in those populations. And then we can go to fish and it gets even more exciting because we have everything we talked about before um, with the XXXY, ZZZW, environmental, parthenogenesis, and then we have behavioral sex determination where depending on different behavioral characteristics, um, individuals will either produce sperm or produce egg, and that can change across the lifespan. So uh, a common example here is clownfish. And so there's often a dominant female, subordinate males. If the dominant female, who's the egg producer, dies, then one of the subordinate males will then behaviorally change and become the dominant female and go from producing sperm to producing eggs, right? So the, the big take home here is that all of these species, and I put the asterisk because almost universally when I say all in biology, I'm wrong. It's one of my big take homes. There's not an all, there's always an exception, but nearly all of these species have individuals who can produce eggs or produce sperm, but they have wildly different mechanisms for getting there. It can be chromosomally, it can be individually genetic, environmental, behavioral. We happen to be a species in a group that has our first switch for determining testis or ovary development linked to chromosomes. It's a genetic sex determination. It's useful and it's important, but the sex chromosomes themselves are not critical or required. And so I wanna, now we'll zoom back in to humans because for human health and development, that's what we often think about. So our human X and Y chromosome, this is an is a image that's a colored image of X and Y chromosome and our sex chromosome. So if we think back, right? We just were looking at all of these different species. Our X and Y chromosomes did not always exist in this form. So initially, about 150 million years ago, they were indistinguishable from one another. In fact, they weren't sex chromosomes at all. We don't know the first steps for becoming a sex chromosome. We try to study those with a different arm of the lab. But what we do know is that these used to be indistinguishable. They were just like every other chromosomal pair in our genome. The chromosome pair, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, where you got an identical copy from mom and an identical copy from dad. Over time, however, We've shown the Y chromosome has lost 90% of the genes it used to share with the X. So the X chromosome has about 1,100 genes on it, and the Y chromosome has just over 100 genes on it. Only about 27 of them are unique. Um, the rest are multiple copy genes. And I'm going to come back to it. 
But a theme here is that of those 1,100 genes on the X chromosome, most of them do things that have absolutely nothing to do with gonad differentiation or development of sexual characteristics. Many of them are really critical for functioning as an organism, and they are preserved over millions of years because they're really critical just to function. Um, there's one other piece here is that because the Y has lost 90% of the genes it shared with the X, we now have a scenario where approximately half the population has a single X chromosome and approximately half the population has two X chromosomes. There's no other case in the genome, not chromosome one, two, three, four, five, where having a single copy of the chromosome is compatible with life. Having multiple, so two, three copies of those chromosomes, are, of some of them are compatible, they're viable, but there's no other chromosome in our genome where having one copy is compatible with life other than the X chromosome. And that's because we've evolved a dosage compensation mechanism. So as the Y chromosome degraded over time, we evolved a similar compensation mechanism in individuals with two X chromosomes that now has fully taken over. So in every individual with at least two X chromosomes, there's a counting that goes on within our genome. And if the genome counts more than one, it will largely inactivate one of those two X chromosomes. And it's done via a gene called EXIST. And that'll be important later. So why, why do we care, right? Why, does, why am I talking about evolution? Why do we care about variation? It's because there's variation in populations. In everything, we think about variation in populations on the autosomal level. We think about variations uh, um, in individual genes. But we also see a tremendous amount of variation on the sex chromosome complement. So I, I will never say what's normal because none of us are normal. But what's typical is that typically individuals who develop ovaries have two X chromosomes, and typically individuals who develop testes have an X and a Y. But I'm gonna make a small visual change here because one of those two X chromosomes is silenced. It's not completely silenced, it's mostly silenced. Uh, I could get a Monty Python reference in here. <laughs> mostly, oh no, no, Princess Bride, right? Mostly dead is not all dead, right? So it's, there's still a few genes that are expressed from that inactive X chromosome. But in general, this means that we have roughly equal dosage between individuals with two X chromosomes and individuals with a, a X and a Y chromosome. But variation across populations is so much cooler than that. So about one in 2,500 assigned female at birth individuals has a single X chromosome. And what's, right, I think everything is cool. So uh, I hope you all think some of this is cool too. About half of the cases where individuals have a single X chromosome and, and develop uh, ovaries or assign female at birth, um, they have a partial X chromosome. And in the other half, they have a partial Y chromosome. So some cases, um, we don't know ex always how this is inherited um, or what, what happened via recombination in the genome. But we know that about one in 2,500 assigned female at birth individuals has largely one X chromosome. And about one in 500 assigned male at birth individuals have two X chromosomes and a Y. Uh, this Klinefelter syndrome, a, a, a single X chromosome is Turner syndrome. But it gets even cooler. So about one in a thousand assigned male at birth individuals has a single X and two Ys. And a similar number, about one in a thousand assigned female at birth individuals has a single, has three X chromosomes. But what you see is that the dosage is roughly similar here because we have these, now if you have three X chromosomes, two of them are silenced. Every X chromosome in excess of one will be silenced. And it allows us to have this tremendous variation on sex chromosomes. We can go a step further. So about one in 1800 assigned male at birth individuals has two X's and two Y's. And about one in 20,000 assigned female at birth individuals has Sawyer syndrome, which is an X and a Y chromosome. Um, where the SRY gene on the Y chromosome either has been recombined away or has a mutation in it. That's a lot of variation, especially if we think about clinical studies, larger genome-wide association studies where we're starting to look at 100,000, 300,000, 500,000, a million people. Exactly as was just talked about, we're going to have individuals in our population that have sex chromosome karyotype numbers, so sex chromosome complement numbers, 
that are not typical. And some people may know their sex chromosome complement. Most people still haven't and don't, and may never know their sex chromosome complement and may involve, be involved in the studies. But when we do our genetic analysis, um, it's something that my lab specifically tries to care about. Um, I'll comment here, though, that uh, for a long time, and still even now, one of the first quality control steps in many human genetic studies is to remove the X and Y chromosome. So just completely remove that variation because they're inherited in a way that's different than the non-sex chromosomes, the autosomes. They carry variation that's slightly different. And so one of the things we advocate for is including X and Y chromosome in genomic analyses, but also looking at your data because people are very bad at knowing exactly what their genetics look at. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because the genetics is not cool enough, it varies over time. Y chromosomes are lost over life and in cancer. And this is some work uh, published recently um, by people at National Cancer Institute, Esther Rian B's lab, um, showing that Y chromosomes are lost in cancer. And sometimes this is a, a process of being a cancer. Cancers are wild and crazy and lose, lose chromosomes all the time. And sometimes they'll lose a Y. And sometimes they lose a Y chromosome and it's critical for the development of the tumor. And don't you worry, if you don't have a Y chromosome, you are also likely to lose an X chromosome as you age. So <laughs> uh, even if you got tested and you knew what your sex chromosome complement was at one point in life, it may be different at a later point in life. Um, am I, as a genetics nerd, someone who would love to know my sex chromosome complement at every point in my life? I would, uh, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> All right. So coming back to X and Y chromosomes. Again, we, I, I often try to call them X and Y chromosomes instead of sex chromosomes. When X and Y chromosomes were first discovered, we didn't discover the Y first, we discovered the X first because it was large and it was called an accessory chromosome. And for quite a while, there was a debate between two major um, labs who were doing microscopy or imaging analysis about what to call these. And for the first, 10, 15 years after what we now call sex chromosomes were identified, we actually didn't know as a scientific community that they had any role or were associated at all with separate sexes. And they were called accessory chromosomes, called the X chromosome for the unknown chromosome. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's only later when it was associated with XX individuals and XY individuals, the ovary producing individuals having two Xs and sperm producing individuals having X and a Y, did they start to get called sex chromosomes? And it, it was not agreed upon, although it did get solidified over time that they should be called sex chromosomes. And I think that is a, has done science a horrible disservice because of those 1100 genes I mentioned, very, very few of them are involved in sex determination, but calling them sex chromosomes makes it easy to relegate them to the process of sex determination. And if a researcher says, I'm not studying sex determination, I don't need to look at them. We are missing quite a lot because in our genome, of all the genes, we mentioned about 2,400, 2,500, 30,000, uh, what is a gene? That's a debate for another day. But let's say how 20 to 30,000 genes in our genome, about 6% of those genes are tumor suppressor genes. 2% of all of those all of the genes in our genomes that are tumor suppressor genes, so 30% of them are on the X chromosome. It seems nearly negligent that if 30% of the tumor suppressor genes in the genome are on the X chromosome, it seems nearly negligent as a first quality control step to remove that chromosome from genome analyses. Even more so is that many of those genes that are tumor suppressor genes escape that X inactivation process, right? So I mentioned it's, it's nearly dead. It's not all dead. <laughs> um, so in individuals with two X chromosomes, whether it's XX, XXY, XXX, they will have higher expression of the tumor suppressor genes because they have two copies of the X and the tumor suppressor genes are some of the few genes that escape that X inactivation process. So we're starting to learn this and starting to incorporate it, but we're only able to do that if we actually look at the tissue sample, look at the number of sex chromosomes that are there, measure the gene expression, don't kick them out early 
and, and start to be intentional about what we're including in our genomics analyses. So I'm going to give you a little vignette. This is active work in the lab. So I know a lot of people were asking about publications. There are some people who are working on this in various labs, but this is work that's been done in my lab very recently as we're actively working on it right now. It started as a undergraduate research project. So I train a lot of undergraduates in the lab. And what we were looking at is taking a look at sex chromosome karyotypes in healthy and disease tissue. And so we're going to look at three different scenarios here that I'm gonna walk you through as a, as a test case for why it's important to understand sex chromosomes in the genome. We're gonna look at a data set called GTEx, the Genotype by Tissue Expression Consortium, uh, which are largely healthy tissues collected from individuals who died of natural causes. So they didn't die of cancer, they didn't die of other disease uh, processes. And we're gonna look at sex chromosome complement there. We're also gonna look at sex chromosome complement in cancer tissues, so in tumors that were collected as a part of the Cancer Genome Atlas project. Um, and then we're also gonna look at cell lines. So what cell lines are, are uh, there are ways that we can study tumors in the lab. So if you haven't read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks or looked up Henrietta Lacks, you should look her up because uh, her cells, HeLa cells, were the first cells that we could ever get to grow from tumors in the lab. They were collected um, unethically from her without her consent for many years. Her family never knew that they were collected. Um, she was a Black woman who came in with cervical cancer. They collected cells from her. And at the time, researchers had not been able to get any cells to grow in the lab at all. And her cells did. And they were able to use these cell lines to study drugs, to study treatments. Um, now, uh, with informed consent and via many people and other processes, we have thousands of cell lines. And these cell lines are used in labs across the world. What we're going to study here are about a thousand cancer cell lines that were developed from multiple different kinds of tumors to look at the sex chromosome complement across all of those cell lines, because these are a proxy. These are kind of a first stage when you wanna test a treatment in the lab before you actually go on to animal studies or then on to humans. Okay, so these are the three different scenarios. So we're gonna look at healthy tissues, cancer tissues, and cell line tissues. And what we're gonna do is infer the number of sex chromosomes. So we can infer that whether there are two X chromosomes or so more, two or more sex chromosomes or one X chromosome by using expression of this gene called exist. And we're gonna use Y-linked genes to infer expression or presence of the Y chromosome across these data sets. Uh, sorry, and this is work largely led by Seema Plasier and with my collaborator Ken Buteau in the lab. And we're gonna look across 40 tissues in the healthy gene expression data set from adipose tissue to brain samples, colon, and uh, these are gonna be separated into samples that were from reported females and reported males. And we see that broadly, we have expression of exist in individuals from uh, tissues from reported females and generally not from reported males. Uh, it's, it's saying that in general, this gene that we expect to be expressed in individuals, two X chromosomes is there. The same is true for the Y chromosome. So we did this for, many Y chromosome genes. I'm just showing you one here. It's my favorite. You're not supposed to have favorites, but I guess in genes, it's all right. Not so much in my children. Uh, DDX3Y is expressed in healthy tissues across the, uh, across a uh, genetic male. And then, I'm, so now we're going to go to the cancer and see if we see the same thing. So is it highly expressed in uh, cancer tissues from reported females? And the Y chromosome should be lowly expressed. The, I'm going to look at just two of these cancer genome atlas samples. I'm going to show you breast cancer first um, from both reported male and female breast cancers. And I'm going to show you liver cancer for one that's a, a, a less uh, organ, sex or organ specific. Uh, so in breast cancer, what we see is that exists um, is like a smear. So some breast cancers have high exist, some have low, some have intermediate. It looks like there's a lot of heterogeneity and that some of those breast cancers are are losing X chromosome or exist expression. And there's been some work showing that loss of exist in um, is found in aggressive breast and ovarian cancers. 
And we're seeing this kind of smear here. Um, we see the reverse. So on the on the right, uh, we, we don't see Y chromosome expression in the reported female samples, and we do see Y chromosome expression in the reported male samples. We don't see a lot of variation here because in this sample, there was not a lot of breast cancer in the reported male samples. I'm going to jump to liver cancer now. And what's really interesting is that now in a, in a liver, every, every human has a liver, <laughs> we see the same spread. We see loss of exist expression across all the reported female samples. And we see, and this is reproducible across tumor types where we have the sample size to look at it, gain of exist expression in reported male samples, suggesting that some of these reported male samples have gained an X chromosome. For the Y chromosome, we also see some of the loss of Y chromosome that was previously reported um, across the Y-linked genes. And so our take home here is that, okay, well, there's probably a tumor is very heterogeneous as it's growing. It's probably losing some X expression in XX samples, but also gaining X expression in the XY samples. What we don't see is total loss of the X chromosome. Um, you still, like I mentioned, those 1,100 genes are important and critical for functioning. And so we don't see total loss of X chromosome. So you can't go from one to zero, but you can go from one to two or from two to one or three or four <laughs> or five, but we don't do that resolution here. Okay, so now we say we know there's loss of X and Y chromosome in cancers. What's going on in the cell lines, the cell lines that are being used in labs as a first pass for testing drugs and treatments? So I'm gonna show you both the X and the Y on the same plot for all of these cancer cell lines. And we're gonna look for evidence of two X chromosomes. And if there's two Xs, we should see everything up here in this gray dot for the reported female samples, and then everything down in that yellow dot for the reported male samples. And that's not what we see at all. We see a totally bimodal expression here. In fact, we see that roughly half of the cell lines from reported women are missing exist. We see a uh, smattering about 10 to 12 of the cell lines from reported males have exist. And that means about half the cell lines um, are, are looking karyotypically normal on the X and half are not. That's a full 50% is a uh, pretty big when you're thinking about your studies and variability. And what about evidence of a Y chromosome? We see the same bimodal pattern. We see nearly 40% of cell lines from reported men are missing the Y chromosome. These numbers are higher than we see in the primary tumors, but we're not sure here whether this is because it's in the process of becoming a cell line, did you lose the X or you lost the Y? Or is it, as we know that aggressive breast and ovarian cancers are more likely to have lost an X chromosome and from the very, very first stages of learning how to make a cell line, aggressive tumors are more likely to become a cell line we can't really distinguish whether this is a consequence of becoming a cell line or you were able to become a cell line because you had an atypical sex chromosome complement number. That's one thing that I would really like for us to do in the future as a, as a field. Um, so our, our take home is that sex chromosome complement in cell lines uh, does not match primary tumors. We do see high exist and Y in unaffected tissues, extremely variable and continuous expression of X and Y linked genes in primary tumors and really bimodal expression of these uh, genes and the representative chromosome in cell lines. And so suggesting that as we go forward, look at your data, always look at your data. I really, um, I, I could not emphasize that more that as geneticists and researchers and clinicians, um, we need to understand what's the variable we're looking at and what are we trying to isolate? And when we're doing that, we need to not make any assumptions, or at least if we're making assumptions, try to describe what those assumptions are and validate them. So here, what I would say is that I would, I would really never trust any reported box from someone. I would want to have independent quality control metrics every time we're running an analysis. And so with that, I will thank our collaborators and funding here and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. That was really wonderful and eye-opening in so many ways. Um, and uh, now we get to hear from Sam Sharp, who will be talking about sex science in the era of gender. <laughs>
Sam is a biologist, educator, and peer support advocate who is committed to advancing the understanding and support of sex and gender diversity. Sam has a PhD from the Division of Biology at Kansas State University, where they also serve as an instructor for the Department of Social Transformation Studies. They were a co-organizer for the first ever Symposium on Sex Diversity and Variation at the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology in 2023. In addition to their teaching and research, Sam serves as a member for InterConnect, an intersex support organization and was a 2023 Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education Fellow with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, focusing on transgender and intersex health policy issues. They are passionate about science communication, inclusive pedagogy, and developing interdisciplinary approaches to studying human diversity. Sam, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Tina. Okay, so now that my slides are visible, I would like to thank everyone for listening today and express my appreciation for being included in this symposium with such an amazing lineup of speakers. Some of the things that I was planning to say have also been touched on by other speakers, which is excellent, and hopefully my contributions will build on what they have already presented and also connect to later on presentations as we all think about these questions of sex and gender diversity. Uh, before I start my presentation, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement, given that I am presenting in Minnesota Makoche on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people who were forcibly exiled from this land because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism. Given the topic of this symposium, I also want to acknowledge that settler colonial violence against indigenous peoples has been both justified by and escalated towards indigenous cultural conceptualizations of gender beyond a man-woman binary and indigenous queer, transgender, two-spirit and gender diverse individuals continue to face escalated and intersectional forms of oppression today. I really appreciate the introduction. I also wanna provide a little bit of additional context about what brings me to this talk today. So I have two pictures on this slide. One of them shows me in the greenhouse at Kansas State University, where I did my PhD research looking at plant response to environmental stress. And I did this through an approach known as ecological genomics, which is a type of evolutionary biology approach in which we consider the interactions between an organism's genome and their environment in an evolutionary context. In addition to my experience and background as a biologist and specifically in genomics, um, I also come to this presentation as an intersex person. I have a picture of myself and my colleague, Marissa, who I think is attending. Hi, Marissa. <laughs> um, uh, the first time we met in person holding an intersex pride flag. And part of why I mention this is because of a concept that I recently learned about uh, that's termed epistemic justice, which has to do with who has the ability to be seen as a valid contributor of knowledge, who gets to be a subject, who gets to be an object, and when systems of oppression and exclusion prevent certain voices from being in rooms where science is done, what kinds of knowledge is left out. And when I was originally invited to give this talk, I was asked to speak about the genomics of sex and gender diversity, and in large part because of my own personal experience and my belief about uh, the importance of epistemic justice, I've chosen to go in a bit of a different direction. So as with many of the other speakers, um, I've chosen to start off with a question of what is sex, which I think is one of the things that is really going to be a through line um, throughout the presentations this week. And so before I talk about how I define or don't define sex, I want to reflect a little bit on what kind of I see as the dominant paradigm of sex, both within academic biology and kind of in general publics. So something interesting about this is that sex is something that is ever present, but it's also often unspoken. And this unspokenness is frequently tied to this assumption that sex is so universal, which is why I have a picture of a universe here, that we don't need to acknowledge it, we don't need to define about it, define it, we don't need to talk about it, we just know what it is. And among academic biologists, if you press them for a specific definition, oftentimes what you'll get is something about anisogamy. And this is a reproductive strategy that involves sexual reproduction in which DNA passed on to the next generation through two gametes of different sizes um, is used to uh, fuse together and create a zygote. So 
The large gamete is known as the ova, the small gamete is known as the sperm, and many academic biologists would say, fundamentally, human sex is based in anisogamy, and your sex is determined by whether you produce the large or the small gametes. And I really appreciate Melissa talking about sex diversity beyond humans. That's a topic that I love, but that I'm not gonna to touch on today. So I'm only going to focus on definitions of sex as they relate to humans. And this idea of is anisogamy a concept of sex that is useful? I think it's very interesting, but is it useful? And sometimes I do believe it is useful. An example of when it might be useful is if we're creating an evolutionary model of a hypothetical individual in a population and how reproductively successful they are. Or if we're thinking about, again, a hypothetical population and how quickly an allele spreads or does not spread through that population across generations. And I say hypothetical here because as soon as we leave the hypothetical and start talking about real individuals, we run into additional complexities. One of these very basic complexities is that humans are not reproductive at every stage of our lifespan. Before going through puberty, we are not able to pass DNA to the next generation through either a large or a small gamete. And until an individual goes through puberty, their ability to do this is largely hypothetical. We don't know if they're going to be fertile or infertile. Additionally, for individuals who are past puberty, there are many reasons why an individual may never or may at some point not have the ability to pass DNA to the next generation through large or small gametes. And this includes illness, injury, congenital differences, and other types of medical interventions. And therefore, in most of the contexts that we think about human sex, such as developmental biology, genetics and genomics, clinical and public health research, and demographic data collection, a definition of sex that begins and, an, and ends in anisogamy is going to be simply not very useful because it will exclude people who need to be included. Additionally, and again, mentioning my um, multiple perspectives on this topic, I think that this definition is inadequate to encompass the lived experience of human diversity. For example, in 2019, ironically on the way back from a biology conference, I was kicked out of a restroom in a gas station in Missouri, and I would bet money that the person who told me that I didn't belong in that restroom and I needed to leave did not care about my hypothetical ability to pass DNA to the next generation through a large or small gamete. What they cared about is that I had a beard. So I do want to touch on the genetics and genomics of sex because I have a background in this area of biology, and I have a lot of respect for both the capacities and limitations of this approach to biological questions. And some of this has been covered already very brilliantly by the previous speakers, but briefly, we do have sex chromosomes as humans. That's part of our sex determination process. And the number and type of sex chromosomes that an individual has absolutely does impact their sex development and overall sex variation. The other, sec the other chromosomes, known as autosomes, um, we have 22 pairs of them, and they also play important roles in sex development. One of the earlier speakers, um, Catherine, mentioned uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is one of the most common types of intersex variation. And the most common type of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is caused by a mutation in the 21 hydroxylase gene on chromosome 6. We also see interactions of sex and non-sex traits, some of which have known genetic causes and some of which do not. For example, another intersex variation, MRKH, in some cases impacts both the development of the uterus and vagina and also can impact the development of kidneys and the ability to hear. So at a phenotypic or genomic level, trying to differentiate uh, sex as a developmental phenotype versus the overall developmental phenotype, that is not something that we can neatly distinguish. And thinking about uh, comparing genomes between different individuals or assessing somebody's entire genome to look at their sex variation, we actually don't have any type of comprehensive genome-wide sex trait assessment where we can look at every possible genetic contributor to somebody's unique sex genotype and phenotype. Additionally, and again, this has been mentioned by other speakers, there are many aspects of how genetics actually works that means that we can't always predict somebody's phenotype from their genotype including epistasis, penetrance, expressivity, fun genetics class words, as well as epigenetics, which can also shift over time. And because of these complexities in the genetics of sex and in the phenotype of sex, the operational starting point for an understanding of sex that I usually use is actually one that um, I first heard about from the intersex advocate and content creator Hans Lindahl, who is the person on the right with pink hair in this image, 
who made a YouTube video about this that I really appreciated. And Hans talks about sex as having seven main components in humans. And I've already talked about gametes, which are the organs that produce sperm and ova. I've already talked about sex chromosomes, but there are also important contributions to sex as a developmental phenotype in terms of the amount of different hormones known as sex hormones that a person produces, as well as the responsiveness of their body's tissues to the effects of those hormones. There's also internal and external genital and reproductive structures and secondary sex characteristics. And importantly, all of these different sex characteristics vary along a spectrum. And Julia Serrano talked about this as kind of a bimodal distribution. And when I refer to it as a spectrum, I'm not arguing that people who have a more intermediate phenotype rather than um, a what we would think of as a typically male or typically female phenotype of any of these traits are equally common, but they do unambiguously exist. And I don't think a definition needs to specify that every category included or every variation included is equally common, but in order for it to be an inclusive definition, it needs to include all members of the population. And because we do see these variations existing, I think it's important to have a definition of sex that can adequately encompass them. And not only does sex vary in what we would think of as intersex variations, it also varies across the lifespan in individuals who do not have or are not suspected to have these variations. And so just a little bit more about sex trait variation between and within bodies. All seven of the traits on the previous slide do have spectrums of variation between bodies, including um, external genital morphology. This uh, line drawing on the left side of the slide is called the Quigley scale, and it's used to demonstrate some of the differences in the external anatomy of the fallow clitoris and labiosrotum. And many people have sort of a common knowledge understanding of you either have a penis and scrotum that looks like this or a clitoris and labia that looks like this and don't have any idea that you can actually have other phenotypes of this component of sex. Additionally, gonads, again, the organisms that produce sperm, ova, and sex chromosomes, typically people have either ovaries or testicles. And on the left, there's a thin stained slice of testicular tissue. On the right, there's a thin stained slice of ovary tissue. However, this isn't true for everyone. Some people, in fact, have organs called ovotestes that contain both testicular and ovary tissue, which is what's shown in the middle um, on the bottom left of the slide. Additionally, and this is also, <laughs> I've been saying this over and over again because the other speakers have done such a good job of touching on these topics. Sex does vary within bodies. It varies naturally throughout the lifespan. We don't have the exact same presentation of our sex traits as an infant, as a teenager, as somebody who's pregnant, as somebody who is elderly. And there's also many other reasons why somebody's sex traits might change over time. We just heard about them changing in cancer. They can change if somebody has, again, an illness, an injury, or undergoes other types of medical procedures. So when we think about sex, it's something that is incredibly variable in terms of the actual granular traits that make it up. And this brings me to where we transition from talking about sex as a multifaceted phenotype with specific parts to sex and gender categorization. So given that sex is neither binary, meaning that there is no good biological way to divide all humans based on their sex traits into one of two categories, and the fact that it's also not abstract, so there are specific sex characteristics that people have at a given point in time that impact their healthcare needs, such as whether or not a person at a given point in time has a uterus. The way that we categorize sex is very consequential. And when we have a biological spectrum, any imposition of binary categories is going to be a subjective process that has to do with the context and the motivations for creating those categories. And the title of my talk is Sex Science in the Era of Gender because the lens and motivation of gender is a powerful director of how these categories of sex are being imposed, created, and what their consequences are. So the way that this happens in the United States, and while this doesn't happen everywhere in the world right now, there is a lot of hegemonic power associated with this type of sex categorization, is what's called the sex and gender binary. This is basically a set of categories and expectations. And roughly these expectations are one, that there are two sets of contiguous sex phenotypes, you either have the male suite or the female suite, that your contiguous suite of sex traits naturally results in a specific gender identity. And that as a result of your sex traits and the way that you express your gender identity, you will be legibly sexed and gendered to other people who perceive you and to medical and legal systems.
So again, this is a set of categories and expectations that is derived from a specific history and a specific set of cultural values rather than being biologically accurate. However, the way that it is enforced socially, legally, and medically is very consequential and is even itself biological. So everybody experiences the effects of the sex and gender binary. Through the process of sex designation at birth, everybody experiences a set of physical observations that then lead to a legal categorization based on sex markers on birth certificates. And in addition to the legal designation of sex, there is an accompanying assumption and prediction of gender, which also includes predictions about how somebody will move through the world, what types of relationships they will have, and their assumed role in reproduction. And this process is not only social and legal, but also very explicitly medical in the case of intersex infants who have identifiable variations in their sex characteristics at the time that they're born. And for the last 70 years in the United States, standard medical procedure has been to perform medical interventions on these intersex children's bodies. And I do want to state that in a small percentage of cases, it is medically necessary to immediately do surgery on an intersex infant. One example of this is if a child is born without an opening through which to void urine. However, these cases are extremely rare. And in the majority of cases, when these early surgeries are done on intersex children, it's in order to set them up to be socially successful within the sex and gender binary. Because for example, it's not enough to assign an intersex baby to a male or female category. They will not be considered to be a sufficient boy or man if they cannot stand to urinate. And they will not be considered to be a sufficient girl or woman if they cannot eventually be the receptive partner in heteronormative sexual intercourse in the presumably straight relationship they are predicted to have through the assignment of a female sex and assumed woman gender. And these surgeries are not inconsequential. Many intersex people have discussed the profoundly negative effects on their physical and emotional health, which continue to follow them throughout life. We heard earlier about the um, high rates of iatrogenic infertility in intersex people and the dependence on external hormones, which in some cases would not have been necessary without these interventions. And this type of coercive medical intervention does not end with early surgeries, both for people who do and do not endure these surgeries, coercive care attempting to force intersex binary bodies to conform to the sex and gender binary continues often throughout the lifespan, including um, coercion or pressure to take certain hormones to achieve more um, sex and gender binary aligned secondary sex traits. Similarly to the prohibition of um, allowing intersex children to grow up in the bodies they were born in, there is also this increasing effort to prevent uh, transgender adults and adolescents from accessing gender affirming care, which sometimes constitutes the same hormones and surgeries. But again, because this is an affirmation of sex diversity and gender diversity that doesn't fit within the sex and gender binary, it's also seen as a threat to it. Again, it's not about the specific surgeries, it's about whether bodies are being made and gender expression is being acknowledged in ways that are more or less conforming to the socially um, constructed paradigm. And I also want to provide a reminder that the sex and gender binary is not objective, it's not inevitable, and it's not universal. It comes from a specific context that I'm not going to explain in detail, but it's very related to the eugenics movement that started in the US and Europe in the late 1800s. And it's also very much related to white supremacist ideologies about who should retain power and which bodies are the best. And as I've discussed, the impacts on medical care and on lived experience are very substantial. And the reason why I did not give the talk I was originally approached to give is because I think taking a biology only approach to these questions is very limited because we're not talking about something that's only biological. We're talking about an experience, a set of expectations and legal, medical and social enforcement of sex and gender that occurs at the interface of science and culture. These problems are always already interdisciplinary and our responses to them and attempts to ameliorate them also have to be always already interdisciplinary. And I don't think that we can adequately solve these problems if we try to silo ourselves in academic science. And so I want to briefly close out by some suggestions for doing better. And very um, conveniently, a lot of these were discussed by both Julia and Catherine. So in order to stay on schedule, I'm going to be brief about this.
but there's a variety of goals, needs, and changes that we need to make in order to address the problems created by this imposition of the sex and gender binary, especially as they impact transgender and intersex people. But again, they also impact cisgender people who also receive gender affirming care and may have bodies that do not fit the sex binary through things like illness and injury. For example, a cisgender woman who has gotten a hysterectomy and whose legal sex marker female and whose assignment of female at birth do not in and of themselves accurately reflect her current organ status. So for these many reasons, research and medicine are some of the areas where we need to see changes in order to better incorporate gender diversity, intersex variation, and sex traits beyond binary categories wherever and however they may occur. And I'm not going to talk too much about handling this in um, client-facing medical care, but uh, one of my friends who works at a genetic counseling clinic wants me to remind everyone that Epic software does allow you to do organ inventories and you should use those when consent is given and when is possible because they're a lot more accurate than just relying on a single sex marker. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, data collection for sex and gender and um, it's not standardized and it's frequently not transparent. And while sex and gender are conflated, they're conflated because of the gender binary and the way that they are conflated in research is often really unhelpful towards getting good data. So it's not that we can necessarily avoid any aspect of this conflation, but knowing what's going on is very important to knowing what our data is and how it can meaningfully be used. Often when uh, electronic health record or ID sex marker data is relied on, we don't actually get accurate information about people's current organ status. And in some cases, questions asking about sex and gender status and traits are very poorly worded. Um, I actually have seen questions that have intersex as an option, but oftentimes they are divorced from the reality of how sex and gender is defined. So for example, a question that says, what sex were you assigned at birth, male, female, or intersex, is not responsive to the fact that intersex is not assigned as a sex at birth. Um, that's part of the problem. And so that question is not necessarily going to give us meaningful data. Additionally, when questions are poorly worded, that limits the ability of what data we can collect. And also some people just simply stop filling out surveys if the questions are confusing or offensive. So the outcomes of this, I'm going to gloss over because they have been summarized, but basically we're just not getting good data on trans and intersex people because they're lumped in with um, general populations. They are considered too complicated or sample sizes are too small. And as a result, when it comes to many aspects of just general public health, we don't have a lot of good information about the prevalence of um, different types of conditions, the impact of medical interventions, or overall health outcomes for trans and intersex populations. And some improvements have been made for the collection of this data and the access to this knowledge for trans populations. A lot more needs to be done, and we're even more behind when it comes to intersex people. So. Some ways to do better is, as others have stressed, to operationally define sex and gender when and where and how we use it. I don't think that we benefit from having a single perfect definition of sex and gender in research. I think we benefit from having a flexible, inclusive, and multidisciplinary concept of sex and gender where we can identify how these concepts are being operationalized in our research. Are we inferring um, organs from somebody's sex marker. That's not a perfect way to do it, but at least we know what happened if you say that's what you did. And along with this, we need to improve the questions that we're asking, including testing them on the relevant populations. I know this is already happening and it should continue. Collaborating with affected populations is really important in order to make sure that sample sizes are adequate research is being done ethically and research is asking the relevant questions for the well-beings of these populations. I also think researchers, especially those without lived experience of being trans or intersex, really need to challenge their assumptions about sex and gender variation on a philosophical level and to be attentive to lived experiences of harm and the populations that they're working with and studying. And oftentimes when I pose these questions to researchers, um, sometimes there's a lot of resistance and defensiveness. Other times there's enthusiasm, but confusion. So I just wanna leave you with these questions of how can you better include sex and gender variation in your work? What conceptual shifts and methodological, methodological changes would you need to make? What barriers exist to making these changes and how could you overcome them? And these are some references from my presentation and we will have a Q&A after the next talk, but I would love to continue this conversation beyond the symposium. You can get in touch with me through email, um, on Twitter or YouTube or through my website. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharp. That was wonderful. Um, and uh, that brings us to our next speaker. Um,
Tucker Pyle. I don't have the, the title of their talk, um, but Tucker Pyle is an MD and PhD in MSTR, a clinical geneticist and physician scientist specializing in the genetics of geno genitourinary differences and cancer at Children's National Hospital in uh, Washington, DC. Dr. Pyle's clinical experience is in diagnostic evaluation and care for individuals with intersex and differences of sex development traits. They're the director of the Children's National Positive Reevaluation of Urogenital Differences, called the PROUD Clinic, focusing on multidisciplinary integration, molecular diagnosis, and cancer predisposition counseling for individuals with intersex and differences of sex development traits and their families. Dr. Pyle is also the director of the CNH Kleinfelter program and the supporting geneticist of the CNH Turner program. Dr. Pyle's laboratory applies genomics and human models to understand variations in gonadal development, infertility, and germ cell tumors. Dr. Pyle's goal is to supply new tools that will facilitate improved care for people with intersex and differences of sex development traits. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Pyle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Say. Um, and thank you for lumping over the uh, large number of tongue twisters in there. Um, so as Dr. Uh, Say said, I do, I do a number of things. I'm a physician scientist, um, and I, I, my, it's my hope that you, what you got out of the list of some of the things that I'm involved in is that I am um, both a clinician and a bench scientist who's very involved in care for folks who have various forms of intersex traits and differences of sex development, including but not exclusively different numbers of sex chromosomes. Um, so what I'm hoping to do now um, leaving a little bit of my uh, bench scientist self behind um, is try to share with you a couple of stories from the clinical environment that I've been privileged to be a part of or to see um, with all of the details mixed and changed when um, appropriate for um, uh, uh, for privacy um, to give you an idea of what some of this looks like in clinical practice. Um, and I think, I'm hoping you're gonna notice a couple of things. Um, one of them is, um, given the talks that we've heard so far, I think quite a bit of the language that I'm going to use may not be optimal. I may know some of that because I may be telling you what the common language is that's used in the medical environment. I may not know some of it. So I also welcome people to point that out um, and teach me things. Um, I uh, also think it's important to note that I say here uh, that the rubber is hitting the road in the clinic, but I think that's absolutely wrong. I think what I really am, um, uh, by being an indirect witness or by being a witness um, to share with you is um, something about where the rubber hits the road in somebody's actual life. So I'm gonna challenge you to think about some of what I'm talking about in terms of what the experience is for actually the affected individual. Um, Many of the talks like this that I give are very different, uh, different actually from this one, because I'm often one of the folks that's asked to come and talk at some sort of symposium about sex and gender, um, and these things perhaps not being a binary, being much more complicated, um, and the very existence of folks who are intersex or have differences of sex development is used to, as a bit of a gotcha. Um, it can't be binary because many of these, many folks are born with many variations in these, and many of us have variations in these things over the course of our lifetime. So I hope to do something a little bit more interesting today. Um, so I'm gonna frame the my first couple of thoughts um, and examples around um, an invented story, um, but this is something that I deal with and encounter in my clinical world every week, um, of an infant who is born with surprise non-binary genitalia. Um, I'm using non-binary to replace what you might see in a lot of literature is ambiguous. Um, that's the more common term that you'll see when you're searching for things. I think that's a point that we need to acknowledge in some of the research around things that have to do with uh, sex and gender uh, variation and variety 
language changes a lot because there's a lot of social pressures. So your mesh terms can be extra messy. It can be really hard to know what to actually search for. Um, I choose non-binary not because it's a particularly good word, um, but because I've um, been able to talk with some intersex friends and folks that feel that ambiguous doesn't capture some capture something incorrect for them, um, that they are not ambiguously male or female in a binary, that they are as they are, or they were born as they were born. So um, it was pointed out by Dr. Serrano that often uh, a child is assigned their sex and gender at birth uh, based on the genitals. And it's a joke I often make that's not particularly funny. Um, when I'm trying to explain to people what I do clinically, um, that uh, often the first thing that you hear right from the OB is it's a boy, it's a girl. And a lot of the children that I get to interact with or folks I get to, to, to interact with are folks where the OB might say, it's a baby. And I think that's one of the clearest points. It's a baby and often a very healthy baby with the exception that the genitals are not as expected or don't fit something that something that allows someone to assign that sex and gender binary at birth. Um, I'm putting up again the quickly scale um, that Dr. Sharp pointed out. So this particular case, we're going to say this is a child who's maybe you know right in the middle. Um, so nobody dares make any assumptions at that point. Interesting that we dare make a lot of assumptions otherwise. So clinically speaking, then the first thing that we do is call in the team. This is in the ideal intersex CSD scenario. You're in a place that's well resourced with lots of heavy specialists um, who are both specialized in their area of clinical interest, but are also knowledgeable in intersex CSD variations. Um, and these folks can come around a table um, and start going through things. And we um, have no major clinical guidelines. We have no major clinical rules. Um, there's minimal for all of that in this field. There are some principles that have been well agreed to, um, at least um, in some of the highly resourced, medic like medically highly resourced areas of the world. So um, North America and Europe tend to talk a lot and tend to agree on these broad concepts. Um, first, that it should be a multidisciplinary team because everybody, this is things that not everybody knows about. Um, second, um, that any decisions that are made, be they about sex and gender assignment um, or about surgical decisions, need to follow a shared decision making model. And I think that is a fantastic thing, and some of you may understand and study that. But for folks like me who aren't a specialist in that, there isn't that much clarity yet about what a shared decision-making model is. How much influence do we exert? How much does a parent get to make a decision before a child is of decision-making age? What's the process? What's the timeline? How much time needs to go into those conversations? How many people talk to how many people? Um, and then bubbling in the back of this in clinical medicine, of course, right, is what's the economics of this? How's everyone getting paid for all of this? Um, and then I would say the newest point, which I see operating very strongly in some institutions and very much not strongly in other institutions, um, and it is certainly uh, legal, which I think a lot of people aren't fully aware of, um, is to minimize irreversible interventions unless they are medically necessary. So to Dr. Sharp's point, right, medically necessary is a question. Um, and what is, well, that's not exact. I don't mean to put words in their mouth, but um, medically necessary is very obvious in something like there is no outlet for which through which the child can pee or can can uh, eliminate stool. There's other areas where people might argue medical necessity, and that's a conversation that may, that perhaps needs to be had. So one could say there is a question about what is medical necessity and what do we mean by that? Um, and of course, all of that is with the idea of trying to um, optimize patient autonomy. Um, and that may be in conflict with some of the other prioritized concepts that I'll bring up a little bit later. So practically speaking, we get all the specialists. And the reason we have all these specialists is to assess all the other things. So if you don't have the genitals to tell you what you're going to say for sex and gender for the baby that was just born, you assess the other components and use what data you have to try to estimate, which drives some of that research then that we were talking about, which is intended to, quote, alleviate this clinical problem, which is intended to help us draw the connection then between, okay, I'm the geneticist. I found that this is the child's chromosomes and this is a gene that's changed in the child. Ergo, this is the data that we have about what that means for 
quite mean for somebody's uh, secondary sex characteristics or gender identity as they age. Um, so we tr the whole reason for having this whole team is to have highly specialized people that focus on their area, the gonads, the pathology, the genetics, the reproductive organs. And then we get together, share and teach each other about that data to then try to estimate all the other things that are in red in the future because it's not following what we would other consider these binary assumed rules. And some of the clinical questions, say for an infant that might fade assist really early are the question of gender assignment, which is both um, driven by all the social factors we talked about and driven by practical factors. Um, requirements for birth certificates, for insurance companies, to get a social security number. It's different state by state, it's different country by country, but the systems, right, the systematic oppression, the systems help drive some of these decision makings. Um, what are the thoughts about the child's future gonadal health? Um, so that gets a little bit to the concept, right, of the gamete-centric focus. Um, will somebody have testes that produce sperm? ovaries that produce eggs. Um, on the flip side of that, is there a chance if they have slightly atypical testes that that could develop into cancer? Historically, that's been a big concern. That's the area of research of my lab. The, there is much lower risk than we once thought, but it's still a conversation. And then will there be surgery done? And at what point? And who gets to make that decision? So the team is trying to fill in those pieces so that we can try to estimate all the things in red We've already heard about all the reasons we can't estimate a lot of the things in red. Um, and then from that, answer these clinical questions about, well, what do we do, if anything? Okay. So those evaluating, let's think about the experience then from perhaps the perspective of this family that has a new baby. So we have a parent, parents that have this new infant. What are they experiencing during that time? Um, there's a lot of visits to the hospital. There's a lot of visits to doctor's visits. In addition to all the newborn things, um, a crying baby, a tired baby. These are part of the conversations I have with a family the first time I meet them. If you, when we walk through this process, you're tired, you're trying to do newborn stuff and you have essentially a healthy baby. And now you're coming to the hospital, you're paying for parking. If you don't have a car, you're trying to get a ride. You're going scheduled for ultrasounds and MRIs, right? In the meantime, they may or may not have introduced this family to the rest of this baby to the rest of their world. Depending on their cultural background, their situation, they may or may not feel comfortable saying, this is our child, this is their identity, this is their name, and so on. So they're engaging all of this at the same time. Um, so imaging of the body system, sometimes there is an exam under anesthesia to evaluate the external genitalia. Um, 10 years ago when I started doing this, we were doing a lot of uh, surgical evaluation in that early point in the first you know, couple of weeks um, to look at uh, what was there for anatomy um, internally. Hormonal testing that can be done in an infant that might give you a sense of what somebody's hormones and then secondary characteristics might do um, in puberty. And you can think about what is that family experiencing during that time, right? So on the left, I have the idea of, you know, this is a protracted distressing process, perhaps. A lot of people have done research into what are the parents experiencing with the assumption that a distressed parent isn't parenting as well and that's carrying over uh, to the child in some way. Um, 10 years ago when I started doing this, we said, this is always an emergency. Like a baby with non-binary genitalia at birth is a social emergency because we need to alleviate that distress. Um, now in our clinic, we talk a lot about um, are we maybe playing a helpful role in slowing everything down and trying to connect the family with supports, peer supports, individuals with lived intersex experience, um, psychologists and professionals, um, because we wanna to try to do something. So we're hoping we're accomplishing something with that time, help them see that they have a healthy baby they can bond with. Um, and then the specialists are all sitting around a table you know, we are sitting around a, a literal conference table with our data, trying to talk about these things and figure out um, what would we offer in terms of assignment. And um, I still enjoy all of this work, but I haven't been doing this that long, right? I said 10 years in practice, um, and I have been at so many tables. I have been at monthly tables at my, at my institution and then monthly tables across institutions where we're essentially debating the same things because we're trying to fill in these blanks that are very complicated and we're trying to make it pretty simple. Okay, so 
let's put some of this in context of a story. And I think um, I'm noticing that the time is technically 105. Um, so I don't know if anyone can share with me sort of what, what I have left. Um, so let's take this in context with um, a child that was born in the early 80s. Um, this was an individual that came and met with me um, because he wanted to understand his own medical history. Um, no childhood records were available. He didn't know anything about his history um, and was raised as a girl um, and always felt a bit off, a bit boyish, a bit different. Might sound a little bit like some trans stories that you've heard. Um, there were a lot of doctor's visits, though. There was a lot of going to the hospital. There were some hormones that he started as a teenager. They told him that was necessary to get a womanly body. Um, and he was um, part of a very, um, he called it conservative religious community and background that means and meant a lot to him. Um, after his parents died, a family member of their generation came to him and said, you know, you had surgery as a baby. And we never, we didn't get to meet you for months. Um, and I think it was on your genitals. Um, so he then moved to another state to explore his identity, try to think about what some of this meant, um, eventually uh, identified that he identified as male and socially and hormonally transitioned. Um, but he really missed his home religious community and didn't feel like he could go back to it. Um, because of his concern about where he would be labeled in the world of sex and gender variance. So to be, to be direct, he feared that he was being labeled as transgender and that that was not something acceptable in this community. So if I could show that he was genetically intersex, he felt that might give him entree back into his community. So he was asking me to tell him his story with genetic testing. Um, I've had the chance to meet Fortunately for me, unfortunately for the number of people in the world that have had this kind of experience, um, a number of people with this kind of experience. And the fact is in terms of the clinical tools, right? We only get a genetic testing positive for somewhere around 30 to 50% of 46 XY individuals with intersex traits that we also presume are genetic. They have a significant enough variance from a binary. So we also believe that that is genetic. Um, and uh, so I said, look, if we get a negative test, it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's not going to dissuade me that you have a history as an intersex person or a person with a difference of sex development and birth. Um, so we talked about the idea that his ident identity, be that sex or gender, could be in the self-knowing that an oral history from the family that was willing to talk to him is, is a valid history, that the medical records were being obscured or were gone and may never be available again. Um, and if helpful to him, my professional opinion was that his body, his story um, was very consistent with what we meet, might hear from somebody who was born with intersex DSD traits. Um, so my medical recommendations um, were, you know, affirmation, counseling, and support, trying to connect him with other folks that shared both some of that intersex background um, and identity and some of his cultural background. Uh, let's see. Oh. Okay. Got it. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, so for, um, let's, let's change time a little bit. So now we have a child that was born in about the 2010s. Um, prenatal ultrasound was uh, predicting a girl based on what they saw um, of the physical genitalia. Um, at birth, um, however, obviously there was the genital difference. It was found that the child was mosaic for a number of different cell lines, including 45X, including some, some Y containing, the th earlier things I talked about were engaged. There was an exam under anesthesia. There was surgery to uh, look at the internal anatomy and biopsy the gonads. Um, it was found the child had ovotestes and a hemiuterus. Um, and then along with that, um, this child had a 45X line, which goes with Turner syndrome. So the rest of the body had to be checked for things that could go with Turner syndrome. Um, and it was found the child had a bicuspid aortic valve, minimal consequence at that point, and was a little bit short stature. So I'll point out that um, the a, a little less we think than 10% of folks that are identified that come to medical attention as having intersex or DSD traits, a little less than 10% have something else going on 
somewhere else in the body that may benefit from being offered medical intervention. Sometimes it's as huge as something serious in cardiac that needs massive surgery. Sometimes it's something relatively minor. Um, but I find this really interesting, the idea that it doesn't have to be pathology to be something that tells us that we need to look further and we might, might or might not find something that helps that person. So um, uh, I apologize. I skipped the part where, based on these features and all the people around the table, it was decided that the, ovo, the ovarian component was going to be removed and that the child's genitals were moved, uh, surgically moved into um, a more assumed male direction. So a typical penis was constructed and the testicle that was still there was moved down into the scrotum. So the child was raised as male until um, a little bit before kindergarten by then, and she was in a very uh, sort of gender open environment. There were books, there were conversations, there were other children that she met. Um, the parents were very much on the same page about this. By the time she was about to start kindergarten, she was vocally and clearly identifying herself self as female. Um, so she socially transitioned. Um, by the time she was uh, in the preteen range, um, her main issue was, um, Read, she would greet me with, Doc, are you going to get my testicle out this year? She wanted that testicle done. It didn't fit with her sense of identity. Um, and she was worried about what it might produce in terms of hormones. She was unconcerned about her penis, her terminology. Um, and in terms of other components, you know, she had at that point identified no crushes or attractions to others when folks talked to her about it. Um, and then um, our last story. So this was a child identified in the area of cell-free DNA screening which is where we are now. So every pregnancy in the US um, is usually offered. Um, it's usually just done. It's not necessarily offered. It is, these are the blood tests for your pregnancy. One of those tests is cell-free DNA screening done off of the pregnant person's blood. Um, and the results from that can identify if someone has about two Xs or maybe one X and whether or not they have some component of Y chromosome. It's often reported as the gender test. And if when you see all the really early gender reveal parties at 14, 15, 16 weeks, it's based off the results of this test. Um, and um, this child turned out to have, um, a, so the cell-free DNA suggested Y containing, the ultras ultrasound suggested female external genitalia. The rest of the story was very similar. Um, and this family um, elected not to do any surgery. Um, and now as a toddler, the family is using male pronouns and a quote male name. The legal name for the child includes a male and a female name. Um, they're intentionally, you know, opening all options to the child and exposing them to things. Um, and as I said, no surgeries have been done to date. So um, I know I need to wrap it up pre pretty quickly. Um, so I think some of the things that we can think about with this are some of the steps and missteps in the language that I used, in the systems that we use, in the things that we focus on, and how these concepts are practically hitting the clinical world. And what that also means for your subjects or your uh, research that you might be doing. So we talk about identifying the intersex individuals. A vast number of people, at least over the age of 30, may have been intersex to the point Point that they had surgery or deep evaluations as a child and they may not know. That was the recommendation at the time. Make the change, don't tell them, move on. They will be as you tell them that they are. So, and then some of the conflicting and drivers that are also present there at the table. So um, every month when we have clinic, we expect to have one family um, with a child who is too young to know or just hasn't been told yet um, about their intersex or DSD traits. Um, the parents don't want them to know. They just want their kid to be normal, typical. I just want them to be okay in this social environment. Um, and these are folks sometimes really pushing for surgical interventions that some hospitals will do and some hospitals will not. Um, and then on the clinical side, we want to help. We want to relieve people's distress. We want to make a change. We want to have an impact. We want to take action. And that's before we add all the other financial pressures in. So um, I'm sort of, we've touched on many of the things about the research side of it and some of the things that, that I've bumped into on the research side. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to you about some of those. Um, it, it results in a lot of lost time as you realize that the patients that you're looking for are being obscured in the system for all the reasons that we talked about already.
Thank you so much, Dr. Pilas. Uh, really important grounding in in uh, how this affects people's lives. Uh, and we're going to bring back uh, all the other panelists for our question and answer session. Uh, we already have several lined up, but if you have a good question, please put it in the Q and A. Um, first of all. You know, we've been talking about how very complicated sex and gender actually are, and uh, there is a person who's a biology instructor and biology education researcher who's wondering if you have advice for how to teach these topics accurately and inclusively in the classroom, especially in introductory biology classrooms where uh, students may not have a background knowledge about signaling cascades and other complicated biological uh, phenomena. Um, I'd be happy to take that question. Um, I've written a couple papers on this topic um, and it's something that I'm very passionate about because most people do not become scientists in the way that uh, they would get a degree and end up doing research science. But I think giving people access to scientific literacy and the ability to have a useful understanding of science um, and to be able to be a critical consumer of popular science information. The introductory talk mentioned the difference between how the researchers said we sequenced the Y chromosome versus the um, people who wrote the articles who said we sequenced the male chromosome. And I think education can play a big role in that. And um, in terms of how to approach this from a teaching perspective, I think it depends on the context. So in introductory biology classes, oftentimes there's so much material to cover and not a lot of time. So I think trying to go super in depth about um, the complexity of all of these different sex traits might not be feasible, but being again, specific about what you're talking about in classes that cover non-human organisms and their sex traits, sex development, sex differentiation process. I think one thing that you can do is emphasize examples of variability beyond what we think of as like a male female sex binary or even beyond uh, chromosomal sex determination because even though that's not necessarily the norm in every taxa it's often again treated as this thing that that's universal because of this human centric bias so emphasizing the different ways that sex can be determined and avoiding imposing human gendered terms and gendered stereotypes on non-human organisms can go a long way and I think when it comes to human sex and gender, emphasizing the difference between the mechanism of human reproduction and the diversity of human sex traits, and then that neither of those things are deterministic of gender. And again, depending on what texts you're using, what your population of students is, the way that that can be communicated might differ a little bit. But yeah, just thinking about being specific and not making things overly complicated, but not trying to simplify them so much that you lose accuracy and enforce these politically problematic misconceptions. Um, I'm also happy to share some resources in the chat uh, if the others want to go ahead. I have I have nothing to add. I support what Dr. Sharp said. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what Dr. Sharp said is excellent. I think we can also not be afraid to, at the very beginning of every biology class, talk about how we are starting with something simple and there's always exceptions to what we're talking about. And there's always more complications. And again, right, it, you can talk about this with very young children. I think there's almost no topic that's off topic. I think, especially if we think about intersex families that are broaching this with infants and their families and people are so uncomfortable, I find, my students don't even want to use the word sex, right? They're like gender, because I feel more comfortable using that word because sex is this loaded word. And, and we can start to normalize talking about the variation from an early age, but then in the classroom, high school classrooms, college classrooms, um, pinning things and giving additional resources. So often at the end of my introductory lectures, I will say, I have given you this very brief topic, there's a lot more to learn about it. And if you want to learn, go here. And I think we can facilitate consuming the scientific literature. I love that concept there. And it's not a thing that's always done in a lot of classrooms is 
encouraging students to go consume more scientific literature and come back. Uh, I think it came as kind of a big surprise to a lot of people that your sex chromosome complement can vary over the course of your lifespan. Uh, and someone is asking about how uh, this realization might affect preventive care. Uh, should genetic testing become standardized for physicals so you can tell whether or not you're losing chromosomes? And if not, why not? Um, what could be done to rectify the gap in information on chromosomes between those in the know and those who are not? I was going to jump in and then I really, because I want Tucker to correct me. Uh, <laughs> I'm wrong. Uh, I wanted to highlight one thing Tucker said, which, and which harkens back to the X chromosome, especially there's a region that's shared between X and Y contains genes that are important for skeletal development, for muscle development, and heart development. And those things can be really critical to know early in life and, and potentially later in life. What I want to say, which is that every time I talk to someone in an Uber or Lyft or wherever I'm going, they want to know, like, what is genetics going to tell me, right? This idea that everything is genetically determined. And for the life of me as a geneticist, I wish we could tell you everything about you and your life by knowing your genetics. But what's way more informative still, and I think will be informative for my lifespan, is knowing a family history, is knowing environmental impacts. Genetics are important, don't get me wrong. Genetics are important. And having that information can be helpful, but we have to be really, really careful to not fall into genetic term determinism to say that once... Uh, once this has happened, then this will happen. We don't know that because there's this wonderful thing that we have 6 billion base pairs and having a mutation or a loss in one region may be compensated in another region and completely masked. And so I personally like to always have more information. I would love to give you a blood spot at every office visit sequence my genome, which we can't do yet. I'm just saying this, this is like my future world where it's amazing and we can do this, right? And I could look at it and I could think about that in the context of everything else I know. I think that's exceedingly expensive. I think we're not able to interpret that yet. And unless it's really, unless there's a medical indication that you might have something else going on, I think right now it would be better to hold off until we actually start until we actually start including sex chromosomes into genomics analysis and know whether there's a risk. Anyway, okay, go. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to offer, um, you know, from the genetics field perspective, um, even though I'm a bit more paternalistic and I have hefty debates with my genetic counseling partner and clinic about it just about every clinic, as a field, we consider genetic counseling always a choice. Um, because some of these psychological concepts of what is and is not determined and how you integrate that and understand that personally um, can be really gnarly and have a massive physical, psychological, medical impact on somebody. So on one hand, we'd say, you know, forced genetic testing of any kind um, or strongly recommended is something we treat really gently and why we do, uh, why the field of genetic counseling exists. And it is a big uh, much needed, underfunded, understaffed field. Um, at the same time, um, I want to acknowledge that the non-invasive prenatal screening is happening. So this is not something that's happening recurrently over time, um, but any baby who's been born to a pregnant person over the age of 35 in the last 10 years, and any baby born to somebody in the States anybody in the last three years probably had that test and they probably didn't have genetic like what we would consider you know a proper 30 minutes of genetic counseling for the pregnant person before that test was sent um and that is giving us a hint to some of these things so on one hand for new babies there's all kinds of data that's going to come out on the other hand as a field we can't really stand fully stand behind the way it's happening um Dr. Pyle, there's a question for you 
could you please address when the psychosocial members of the multidisciplinary care team get involved in the care of intersex newborns and their parents? Yes. Um, you know, I think really it's reasonable in the context of today to be questioning the entire structure, right, of the medical care um, that's being provided for these individuals or these families, especially in the pediatric setting. Got to acknowledge again, we're ignoring the, the adult context, and there's a huge dearth of clinicians that have any idea how to approach things and be helpful to adults. It's a huge problem um, for intersex DSD care. Um, the when somebody gets involved, who gets involved, um, in my experience, is highly variable depending on the team. So before I started growing a team at one institution, then moved to the place where I'm running running another group, um, found it that beautifully founded by a colleague, um, I went and visited a bunch of the clinics. And part of what I learned was everybody was trying to do this multi multidisciplinary model, which again, I think is somewhat built on this idea that we need to fill in all these perimeters of sex to try to estimate the future. So is this even a good model? Um, every team actually had, no matter what's on their website, a slightly different complement of clinicians there um, at the time, some that would follow up later, some that were just unavailable, um, some that uh, their, their division couldn't get reimbursement anymore for that care. So that specialty was completely absent. And one of the specialties that's hardest I think financially to get in the door is the psychosocial, which I think as a whole, the field in the States is saying, and they need to be the number one and the first and foremost, because affirmation, calm, support, and understanding should be the first thing for parents and the individual. Um, so yes, there seems to be an agreement among a lot of folks that it should be first, but for a whole lot of reasons, including access and financial, it's that's not what's happening. Um, if you'll allow me a little bit of leeway, I'm, I'll go ahead and tell you all part of how the Children's National Program, in my opinion, is working so well, um, and that it's uh, not something you can count on. Um, every clinician, when they do a visit, right, has to uh, submit for reimbursement. And that money goes to the hospital and the division, and that's part of what keeps the lights on and keeps everything going. This is the medical system that we're in right now. Um, in our clinic, we have, um, the urologist, the endocrinologist, the pediatric gynecologist, the psychologist, the geneticist, the genetic counselor, the clinical research coordinator, the nurse guide. The urologist has to bill for his time, but most of the revenue for a surgeon comes from surgery, so that's not a big stress. I have to bill for my time. All the others are volunteers from other government institutions. In DC. So work for education, run lunch, some work for FDA. That's the way that we're able to make it work. Otherwise, it's not a system model. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's me or uh, Tucker, but I lost you a little bit there. Um, I, I'm going to go back to a question that I think uh, touches a lot on uh, Dr. Sharp's talk, especially the tips at the end for doing better in research. There's a question about how do we as researchers design sex-specific experiments to better translate uh, animal studies to human conclusions? Would clearly identifying sex chromosomes by sequencing and other methods aid in this translation? Um, and what other tips might you have for, for that sort of uh, translational research? Um, I can take a stab at this one, but I do want to reiterate that my wet lab background is in plants, so I don't have a whole lot of experience creating animal models, but I think kind of as we've been saying throughout the symposium, specificity is important, and not every animal model is going to have every human trait, and I deeply appreciate the research of um, my colleagues who are on the Zoom screen right now, but I also think that sex chromosomes are overestimated in their impact on sex phenotypes. And um, there is also sometimes a over 
confidence in the amount of information we can get from uh, DNA sequences and given the differences in how sex chromosomes work in different species and the way that the Y chromosome is being eaten away over evolutionary time um, post-divergence, I don't know if that would necessarily be the best way to make that research more translatable unless we're specifically talking about research on sex chromosomes um, as they impact sex development or other traits. I think for other types of phenotypes, other things might be more important. Um, in some cases, if you're looking at a particular type of uh, discrete condition or features of a condition, if you can replicate that in the model, I know um, they replicated some aspects of polycystic ovarian syndrome in mice, which was interesting for learning about the impact of anti-mullerian anti hormone in the uterine environment. Um, so I, I would say that it depends, and I'm also not the person to answer uh, model organism specific questions on a more granular level. I can jump in a little. I Yeah, I, I totally echo that they are poorly named in sex chromosomes do many things and very few things in sex determination. And the, most of the genes in sex determination pathway and sex differences are not on the sex chromosomes. And so it really depends on the question. I think for animal models, I have two comments. One is to try to understand what it is, again, you're looking at. But for example, um, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition in humans uh, that has about an eight to one female to male incidence bias. and uh, in humans, there are loci in the X chromosomes and also gene expression on the X that are known to be important for rheumatoid arthritis. However, the animal model, the mouse model of rheumatoid arthritis does not show any sex difference in incidence and development. And so to me, one thing that is really important could be understanding why there isn't a sex bias in incidence in the animal model and why there is in humans. Does it have to do with diet? Does it have to do with exposures? Does it have to do with the actual comp Maybe it has to do with something on the sex chromosomes. Perhaps the X inactivation, well, so not perhaps, X inactivation is different in mouse than humans. And so that might be related to it because we know some genes involved in the immune system are escaping inactivation only in T cells and B cells, and the immune system is different in the mouse model in humans. So it leads to more questions than answers, not necessarily just what is it, but actually why is the difference there versus not. I had a second point, but I'll stop now. <laughs> okay. Well, yes, we, we have uh, run over a bit, and so I'm just going to throw out one last question. Um, for our panelists and then uh, we'll break for lunch. Um, so there is a long history of making medical advances by closely studying atypical conditions. Uh, what can the close study of intersex conditions contribute to our general understanding of sex? I don't have a good answer for that question. I'm thinking about a lot of the caveats. You know, I'm a right, I'm a PhD geneticist and I'm a clinical geneticist, right? And we are we are the doctors of all of those genes that um, that have been identified in part through identifying folks that have different forms of variation. Um, I do think there are certain things that we can learn about sex and gender. Um, I think we need to, do I believe this? I think we have an idea that we can solve the gender question um, by studying folks who are being oppressed and marginalized anyway, and that that's really dangerous and it's dangerous in a lot of different contexts. You know. Um, Dr. Sharp brought up the, the eugenics concept, and I was really lucky to start my research training um, years and years ago um, at a mouse lab that started our first class on this is genetics and genetics grew out of the world of eugenics. That's the foundation of our field, and we need to recognize what our foundation is to try to get a sense of the house that we're building. Um, I... Uh, 
And I think we need to acknowledge that we're talking about an area that has all of these special social things. You can learn about height by studying my family. You can't tell, but I'm six foot two. For someone assigned female at birth, that's pretty typical. And I'm short um, compared to women in my family. Um, but we are not marginalized because of our size. Um, so that is that is different, I think. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. Um, I think it is true of genetics research that often we learn what a gene does when we observe variation in it. But again, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between genotype and phenotype, especially with something as complex as sex development. I also think that Something that I like to talk about that I didn't get to talk about today is that even defining intersex as a category is something that there is zero consensus on. If you talk to intersex people, some of them don't like the term intersex, which types of variation should or should not be included is also hotly debated by um, parents, people with lived experience and uh, medical professionals based on whether the motivation is to have a more inclusive or a more exclusive definition. But I don't think looking at sex variation as something that only applies to intersex people is accurate or helpful because, again, it's important to define intersex as a developmental phenotype because of the way that it's historically been medically constructed, because of the way that communities have had to be created to respond to experiences of harm and erasure, and because of these ongoing and specific and unique types of social, cultural, and medical marginalization. But if we think about sex phenotypes that don't conform to um, this upheld sex and gender binary, that's not just intersex people, that's also people who've had gender affirming care, including cis people. That's again, cis people who have had illness or injury that means that they are no longer have the same type of body parts that they did when they were born or that other cis people do. And so understanding um, how bodies work, what kinds of medical interventions are helpful, how different things are related to each other in both genetic and non-genetic ways is something that isn't only true or relevant for um, intersex populations. And ideally we could study that in a way that's not exclusive to, but is inclusive of intersex people. Um, and also looking at uh, development of sort of gender as like a biopsychosocial phenotype. I think, uh, again, we need to stay away from trying to use intersex people to like prove the existence of sex or gender variation, but thinking about all of those things together, including intersex people. And if a definition exists of something but doesn't include intersex people, then I think that's an, always a good indicator that it's a bad definition and, and we need to revise it. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your great talks and for this wonderful discussion. So we will be breaking now until 2.30 p.m. So please come back because there are more speakers this afternoon who are going to, I'm sure, blow our minds with all of the wonderful information they'll be giving us.